Running Wild with Christine, Sex, Success, and Other Slippery Rabbit Holes. Episode 2, Fake It Till You Make It. Hi again, it's uh, Christine from Running Wild with Christine. Um, I'm the author of newly released memoir called Just Bad Timing, in which I recount my little life, my thoughts on postmodernism, my raucous trysts, and take you around the world in an often hilarious personal quest for meaning. It's an exploration of intimacy and modern relationships in the age of Tinder, the gig economy, and social media-induced FOMO, which poses lots of questions like what do real love and success entail, and how do we navigate the expectations we set for ourselves while carrying the weight of expectations others set for us? Why is it so damn difficult for women to embrace their sexuality and speak proudly about it? Um, So that's why we're also here today. This podcast is a safe place to ask all the questions. You might be afraid to ask somebody or never knew really who to speak to or why or how. Um, And so today I am here with Kat Knox, a publicist for Boston Marathon bombing survivor Jeff Bommand, and also my own publicist. Uh, Kat's an independent media um, and publicity consultant, and um, she's my favorite person to tell my ridiculous stories to lately. So, (laughs) hi, Kat. Hello. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am very tired from a seven-hour bus (laughs) ride back from Paris, but, you know, we'll get to that story. (laughs) I can't wait. (laughs) On another day. Um, How are you? How are you feeling? It's um, the fifth year anniversary of the Boston bombing on April 16th. Are you getting ready for that? Yeah, just a few days from now. Yeah, it's really surreal. You know, sometimes it feels like it was yesterday and sometimes it feels like it was 20 years ago so it's really crazy to kind of be at this milestone and um but it feels good to look back and kind of see the progress that Jeff and the other survivors have made um and the city of Boston you know it it feels like the fog has lifted a little bit and each year as the milestones and the marathon comes up like I think people are you know things seem to be getting a little bit back to our new normal yeah um yeah I can't even imagine um, so maybe actually that's a pretty good place for us to start. Um, I know that the the bombing really affected your life. So yeah. do you want to tell me a little bit more about where you were at in your life personally and, you know, how that changed everything um, afterwards for you? Sure. So in 2013, I was like at a really interesting place in my life. I was married at the time. We had just moved back up to um, Boston from Connecticut. Um, we were staying with my mother. Good <laughs> um, times. It could be a whole another podcast. Um, but, you know, uh, my husband at the time and I, we were at a really weird junction in our relationship. We had met in college and, and you know, fell in love there. And it just kind of felt like our trajectories were off. Um, And so we were kind of taking this time to regroup and figure out, you know, I think we told ourselves we were saving for a house and, and figuring out next steps. But for me, it was really just, I think once I got there realizing I was figuring out the next steps in our relationship. And, um, I, you know, I had a job that I was doing pretty well at and I was just trying to like get by, like I was just taking it day by day. Yeah. And on April 15th, 2013, um, the bombings happened in Boston and, um, I was like so pissed. I was at work that day. Like I was supposed to be down there, like drinking and like having fun with all my friends, like we normally do, but stuff work. So I was there and just kind of scrolling through Facebook and like started to see like people commenting about explosions at the finish line. And I, you know, didn't really know what was going on. And then I see this like awful picture of this man in a wheelchair um both of his legs are missing his face is sullen he has like soot all over him and he looked kind of familiar but I couldn't really place him yeah um and then a few hours later I found out he was Jeff Bowman my friend Aaron's on again off again boyfriend yeah um and at that time too it was just like a really surreal day you know they had shut off cell phone service because they were worried that there were other devices. So like, you know, we were just using Facebook and social media to try and get a hold of anyone. And I was trying to get a hold of Erin and like figure out, make sure that she was okay. And, um, yeah, cause she was running it. Yeah. She was running. Jeff was down at, um, at the finish line waiting yeah. for her. Yeah. Um, so then that was Monday. Um, by Thursday night, Jeff had woken up and the first thing he said was like, 
I saw the bomber, like I know who yeah. it was. So he immediately identified the bombers and that kind of, for people who aren't familiar with the story, like created this massive manhunt in Boston. There was yeah. a shootout where an officer was really wounded and um, they literally shut down like the whole Metro Boston yeah. area. Um, and on that day, you know, I like was glued to the TV and I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like the shootout and everything happened like a few miles from my office. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just like, like anytime there's an awful like terrorist attack or act of violence, it's just, you just sit glued to the TV and it's so surreal. And mm -hmm. then a few hours into it, I got a call and it was Erin and her sister, Gail, who's a very close friend of mine. And they were just completely overwhelmed because the press was like showing up at people's houses and like calling them and just trying yeah. to get, you know, Jeff was kind of like the Holy grail yeah, at that for, point sure. for a story because he was in that picture that kind of became the iconic face of the tragedy yeah um, and he had identified the bombers so anyway they were completely overwhelmed and needed help um and so they were like cat you're good at publicity right <laughs> like you can take this on and i was like i think so like I, it's in my wheelhouse i guess at the time i was working as a lecture agent so i was working with you know like thought leaders and yeah. authors and like publicity was definitely a part of it but it, it was i was by no means a publicist yeah. um and so yeah i just kind of said yes I was looking for any way to help yeah and help you know at that time I think everyone in Boston was just looking for a way to help so I jumped in and I'm literally it's like the most ridiculous scene in the world like I was sitting on my mother's living room floor I had like yellow pajama pants with like monkeys on them from old baby <laughs> and like just cracked open two laptops and like went for it and like so I just started fielding calls from like international media yeah. like all of the big media in the states like and just kind of kept a log and was like the home base for all of that. Mm -hmm. And then um, a few weeks later, I went and met Jeff in the hospital. And um, that was like a really surreal experience. I showed up and like it, he was at Spalding Rehab then. And um, I had to give like a code name to get up yeah. to his floor. And once I got to the floor, I realized that like all of the other survivors were there. Yeah. Um, and it was just, I think it, it was at that moment that the enormity of what had happened really hit me. Yeah. Um, I and I like imagine. totally broke down. I, after a meeting with Jeff and going through kind of like the motions, I got back in my car and I just like lost my mind and was like bawling. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I am not a publicist. Like I, I am, you know, he, like I said, he's like kind of the Holy grail of this yeah. story. There's probably a million publicists in the whole, in the world that would like kill to have this opportunity. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. yeah what the fuck and I am stopped I and I thought about Erin. Yeah. Who is just such a special person to me and, and she needed help and was asking for my help. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, I knew how to be a good friend yeah. and I knew that I knew how to take care of people. So I just kind of like held on to that for dear life and yeah and, and went it, for it <laughs> and the rest is kind of history for sure and I think it would have like really made a difference for them as well if it wasn't you who didn't know the dynamics behind the family and the and the people involved and yeah. like the story is never just like one person so for sure. yeah because as, as much you know like when you think of publicity and publicists like usually the goal is like there's some there's some element of like protection but you're also like really trying to get publicity for someone yeah. this was like the flip side of that yeah. like i was just trying to like help them navigate this like crush of media attention that they were experiencing in the worst time of their life exactly it's so like it, so less when you think about it like yeah. yeah and it kills me now when i see like any of these like you know, since the bombing, like the other terrorist attacks that have happened or the shootings here in the States, like when yeah. I see these kids like just thrown onto the TV, like completely unprepared, it just kills me. Cause it's like, they're not even mentally processing what's happened, but like, it's like, yeah, it's like the media just wants to create this hero. Yeah. 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 And like, look, they pull the story to create that narrative and like these poor people are just thrown into it when they're really just trying to heal and like figure out what the hell has just happened with their life. So that's a lot of what happened with Jeff was I was just trying to like run interference. Um, but at the same I, time, like stuff was also happening for you. Like you, you would just like overcome ovarian cancer, right? 
Uh, yeah, I had like a, a run in with cervical cancer. Cervical, um, so I never say that like, I'm like a survivor. Yeah. I didn't have to go through like chemo and, and the things that a lot of other women unfortunately have to deal with. But it was like a pretty aggressive form. So I had a couple procedures and um, yeah, it was like a really, it was kind of crazy because I felt like I didn't have a purpose. Like I, I had that going on. I didn't know what was happening with my marriage. Like I was living at my mom's, my mom's house. Like yeah. I had a career that I was excelling at, but I wasn't. I in wouldn't love with say it. I'm passionate about it. Yeah. So it's just kind of getting by. And then this whole experience, I think I just let allowed myself to become immersed in it because it was something to hold on to and it was something that I was passionate about. And I felt like even though maybe I didn't have the like tools and the wherewithal to take care of myself in that moment, I could take care of other people. But it's so interesting now looking back five years later because like I realized like I actually was taking care of myself. Like yeah. I was taking a cheap and like giving myself the opportunity to learn and and gain experience and make connections that five years later you know have completely changed my life yeah but did you quit your job right on the spot or like how did you work that out (laughs) no it was a really crazy like five years so I was working full-time at the agency kind of doing all of this just stuff like you know I would wake up at four or five a.m and work on that and then go to real work and then come home and do Jeff stuff. And it did get hard because there were times where like, I would have to go be in person, you yeah, know, with Jeff and do things. So I would have to kind of like make excuses and like find a way to do that because it, it's not that they weren't unsupportive, but I just don't think that work understand, understood the personal connection. Yeah. That, and like why it was so important for me to protect Jeff and help him. Yeah. And in a um, way, in a way it's not their role either to understand. So you're just oh, like caught between like right. two bad choices of right. like, yeah. And I, and I was the breadwinner, so I was like, I, I can't do anything to fuck this up. Can I say fuck? Yeah, Sorry. you can say whatever okay. the fuck okay. you want. Okay. <laughs> I can't do anything to fuck this up. And so, you know, and I'm kind of like, I really, uh, met, at that time, measured my success by the success of my career. So I was driving myself into the ground because I was trying to do great at work and keep up with this and hold on to this marriage that wasn't working and, and process your own um, sanity. Crazy. So, and then, so ultimately we did get divorced and because of that too, I had to kind of get another job. So I was waitressing, oh <laughs> working God. at the agency and doing Jeff stuff. And it just got insane. But ultimately a few, you kind of in the middle of this whole journey, things did balance out and I was back to just the agency and, um, and Jeff, but last fall, I kind of found myself at a crossroads because um, the movie based on Jeff's story was coming out with Jake Gyllenhaal, and so I had an opportunity. The movie's called Stronger. For all of Stronger. you who aren't aware of it, watch it. It's a good movie. It's on Amazon now. Go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> good job, Kat. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had this oppor- incredible opportunity. So I had kind of been. I had. Let me take a step back. We did Jeff's book, and that did really well. And then um, this movie, Stronger, based on that, was coming out with Jake Gyllenhaal. And I played a pretty integral role in the book-to-film process and had been involved in the publicity all along just as Jeff's rep. Um, so when the time came you know, for movie publicity, I had this opportunity. It was an opportunity, and it was also like Jeff needed me yeah. to be with him at this time. And that was, again, another really hard thing for work to understand. So I found myself at this crossroads where I was like, okay, I can, I have this opportunity to travel all around the country, um, with Jeff and Jake Gyllenhaal, which is like <laughs> not a bad thing to do. Um, Sign you know, and, 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 and really like kind of put my publicist pants on <laughs> and, and do this. Yeah. Uh, and so it was for, for a, an incredible, uh, work opportunity. And then, it also was like Jeff needed me. Like I knew he would not survive this whole experience if I wasn't there. Cause I'm not just his publicist. Like I'm literally yeah. like Jeff, please brush your teeth. Like Jeff, you need to get up at this time. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Jeff, this is what you're wearing. Jeff, you can't say that on the today show. Like I'm just <laughs> his person. Yeah. So I was like, fuck, what do I do? And I was trying, I had had an initial conversation with my mentor at work who is amazing and was really trying to understand. Um, but he was like, you can't do both. Like you can't just disappear for two months and then come back. Yeah. Um, and so I said, fuck it. Fuck, fuck <laughs> it. Like I have spent so much, I have built, I have built this up. This has been such a big part of my life. Like 
and this is like a really fucking cool opportunity. Like I, and then I thought back and I said like, okay, so I'll figure it out. I'll quit and I'll figure it out. And that's what I did. So I like that day that there was like that, I don't know if they had it over there. But, like we had this crazy solar eclipse thing last August. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I literally like looked at the eclipse and I was like, I'm doing it. This is the day. Like, this is the time. <laughs> so I like went in and I was like, I'm leaving and I'm going to be a publicist now. <laughs> and like literally just quit my job. The next week I was like at the Toronto Film Festival, like walking the my carpet with Jeff and Jake and like, just like, immersing myself in this publicity world and it was just like it was insane and you're like what the <laughs> hell am I doing here <laughs> it was so funny because I literally like just got caught up in this whole experience and you know it was like um, it was amazing like I learned so many things I was so lucky to be working with the people I worked with everyone was super supportive and it was fun like it was I am so I would be so pissed at myself if I hadn't given myself that opportunity. I so mean, that, yes, obviously, because yeah. you wouldn't have met me, and then we wouldn't be here. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're my new favorite Skype bestie. Like, there's no way this would have happened. And, like, I would have been, right now, I would have been sitting in a job that, like, I just wasn't passionate about, and I hadn't, you know, I had kind of maxed out my growth potential there. And, like, now, because I took that chance... I'm working with people like you and like learning incredible stories of incredible people and just kind of like, I'm the master of my own destiny. And there are days where I wake up and I'm like, what the fuck did I do? Like, <laughs> where's my 401k? Like, like my health insurance sucks right now, but you know what? Like, it's so funny because like, those are the things that I used to measure success by. Yeah. Now I'm like, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Like, and I think that's, okay. that's the main like topic that we initially bonded over because basically I was looking for a publicist um when I was um when the book was pretty much ready to come out and I was talking to a few different people and I was like I have no fucking clue what I'm doing like I wrote a book <laughs> I don't know anything about publishing a book but let's do it all on my own that's such a good <laughs> idea and so like I I think I was writing a high of like finding the right editor and I really like lucked out on that. And then mm -hmm. and then looking at publicity, people were asking me questions like I ha I randomly posted on Upwork like, "Oh, I need a publicist or whatever, I need help." And uh like within 4 hours, I got like the four different emails and pitches from different people asking me questions that I was like, Oh my God, I'm supposed to know the answers to this. And I'm like, <laughs> I used to be a recruiter so I can fake it on the phone and pretend that yeah. I know what I'm talking about. But like at this point, this is me and hiring. I was faking it just as much when I was talking yeah, to Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I'm like, I can fake it like enough, but I'm like, at, at a certain point, I'm going to actually need to know what the fuck I need from this person, like for them to know, like, you know? And so we're both on the phone like, how funny, like you worked on a memoir from a real life. Like that's already like coincidence number one. And then like, you're like, I just launched my own business. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I was like, coincidence number two. <laughs> There's like so many points in common here. Let's like swim in these deep waters together. I'm just like redefining what we make for ourselves and like yeah. and this is something that we talked about with Kata at a different time is that like we both sort of had this feeling that guys do this like on a regular basis that they're sort of like you know ingrained in the in the social like um upbringing to be like yeah just like you know, pretend or like, you know, look cool or sound cool and you'll get there. Whereas like women, like we, like it's statistically proven that we don't apply yeah. for jobs unless we qualify for like 80% of. So yeah, it's men, men will apply for a job. Like if they're like on LinkedIn or like career yeah. or whatever, they'll apply for a job if they feel like they have 60% of, of the required, the, of like requirements. We won't, women won't apply unless they feel like they have 90 to 95%. Like that is insane. Like when I started doing this with Jeff, I probably had 15% of the requirements yeah. to do what I was doing, but like I figured it out and like, and you, you learn can't yourself of the opportunity. Yeah. And I've learned so much. I mean, it was definitely like the, the ultimate trial by fire yeah. and there were moments where I was like on the phone with like well, he's like bad now, but like people like Matt Lauer and yeah. like Brian Williams and like the big press people here in the States. And I'd be like, this is the one, like, this is the phone call. They're going to like figure out that <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> but like, I was like a duck, like on the surface, I was like, I'm home collected and underneath my feet were like, oh my God, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, I just, you just, you have to trust yourself and you have to figure out the parts of the, of what's facing you. Like, 
even if you don't have a hundred percent of what's going on, you can pull out one or two things that you know that you're good at yeah. and hold on to it. And like the rest will come. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, um, <laughs> you know, if you, if anyone else knows like what it feels to have that sort of imposter syndrome of just like being in a situation where like, if you, looking back, you're like, oh my God, I did so well considering how little I know about anything that's going on. And so I think that, that it's just trusting that the stuff that you are good at is going to shine more than the stuff that you need to learn because yeah. not everyone knows everything. Like no one knows everything that you need, you know, unless you've been in the same job for 20 years, in which case you're probably not that interesting because you, there's always things to learn. So <laughs> if you feel like you've learned it all, then you should be doing something else. Um, but like at, in the process of learning the stuff that you need to do, um, like as you go, it's just like, you, if you don't surround yourself with people who are in the same boat, you think like it's, I, I mean, I know through the process of like you and me working together, like some mornings we're both like, I am not having a good day. Like I'm not having a good <laughs> week. Like I feel like everything is failing and like, um, you know, whatever you were like, I had a fight with my boyfriend and I'm like, I don't even have a boyfriend. I will never have a boyfriend. I don't know. Like, not that I want one, but you have days where like everything sucks. You're like, I ran out yeah. of milk. The world is going to end. Cause like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> but, my dog, there are days like my dog would look at me the wrong way and I would cry. Like, yeah. I just... But that's okay. And that's sort of what I was trying to get at is that like the fake it till you make it is actually a healthy thing if you take it as a healthy coping mechanism not as a like huh, I'm just gonna pretend and like run and hide and do nothing but like I'm yeah. just gonna pretend for now until like I do six hours of mad googling and watch some YouTube tutorials and then yeah. I learn it and it makes the wins that much sweeter and the other thing that I've realized in this is like everybody feels this way mm -hmm. you know a lot of my clients, like I work with like someone in the state department and like a really, the first female CMO of a huge global tech company. And like, everybody feels this way. Yeah. My own mentor, you know, she was really like the impetus for me to actually make this decision. She basically was like, if you don't do this for yourself, like I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah. Um, and she said, and she's like a really like, like hot shot. Like she's been doing this for years. Like she doesn't fuck around. And she was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm she did the same. She just did the same thing. She left her agency and yeah. started her own thing. And she's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I'm charging people $500 an hour. And you know what? They're paying me and I'm getting it done. And yeah. I'm like, if she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing, then like, who does? No one does. And like, like, it's, you just have to go with your gut and follow your passion. Yeah, and I think that's like that's a massive realization for me. It's like I always knew that creatives felt that way, or when you work with people, that you feel that way. But I sat down with my best friend, who's a doctor, and he was like, "I don't know what the fuck I'm doing." And I was like, "Well, that's slightly <laughs> concerning." Yeah, but I guess yeah, something I, like that that's like not so subjective, like PR. Like you probably should know what. You're no, doing. but I mean, they all feel like they still don't know. Is what I'm trying right. to get at. Like he does, and people survive, and he heals them on a right. Like he's doing really well in his job, but the feeling is there. He's like still always under the impression that he's gonna miss something or forget something or 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 didn't read something 17 times, but only 16 times, and therefore, and I'm like, we all have that like sort of thing in us that that is going to hold us back if we let it. And so, um, I think it's really important to sort of recognize that. And, and, and I think that the same goes with everything, like your job, your relationships. Like I'm, I know like you and I are in the same boat when it comes to like explaining to the people around us that this is like a legitimate job, even though we yeah. don't feel like we're <laughs> legitimate. So it's like this weird thing where you're like, I have no fucking clue, but also listen to me say the things that I know. <laughs> because... right. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes I feel like my family and friends and like boyfriend think that I'm just like here hanging out in leggings all day, like just Googling, but like I'm working my ass off. I'm working harder than like I ever have, but just because I'm home doesn't, you know, it doesn't. I could be doing this in an office and I'd be doing the same things, but it's just funny that that comes with the stigma of like, Oh, you're a freelancer and you work from home. Like want to go to the mall at three o'clock? Like, no, I have to like fucking do pitches and stuff. Like I have things I'm doing. But, but also like it's the same reverse thing with like, Oh, it's Saturday, blah, blah. And you're like, ah, great. And then you, at certain points you do have to give yourself Saturdays, even if they're on a Tuesday yeah. to just like let loose and not just because the work yeah. doesn't end when you work on your, like, it never ends. There will never be a time where you're like, I've done all the things I had to do. Right. No, but <laughs> no. The, mm. 
that doesn't exist. And so I feel like that for me was like a really big realization this year is like surrounding myself with people who, even if they have like nine to five jobs and a 401k <laughs> and like a regular life, like still have that drive to make something, to make something for them, whatever that is, like pottery or whatever the fuck. It's just like having that understanding that, you know, whatever you, whatever you use your time for is what defines you because you chose to make those decisions. And so like butting up against like people like, okay, so now you're going to just go back to real life and get a job. This is real life. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like we were saying before, you know, I feel like, and I was so guilty of this for so long, like going back to that moment, like on my mom's living room floor, like just trying to figure out like what, my life was going to be like for so long I felt like I lived with this mentality of like I'll be happy when like I got married and I was like okay this will all be okay when we buy a house and have a kid or like with my career I'll be like I'll be happy when I accomplish xyz and like I had this feeling that like my life had to be like linear and there was this trajectory and like milestones along the way that I had to hit and if I didn't hit them you know one of my goals was like oh, I'm going to have two kids by the time I'm 30. Well, I'm going to be 33 next month and I have zero children and that's okay. Like, yeah. like I feel like you, you feel like you have to hit these milestones. But we're programmed. Time. You drive yourself crazy. You do. Like your, your life doesn't have to be linear. Like it's no. okay for it to be like a trellis. Like let your little IVs like go and figure out what you latch onto and what you're passionate about. Yeah. And the um, because otherwise you're going to drive yourself into the ground and you're going to drive the people around you insane. Well, exactly. And this is the thing, like, I think this was one of the major processes, like, and it's in the storyline of, of my book is that like the moment where my life looked the most like the prescribed script that I was sort of like educated to follow. That's mm-hmm. when I was the least happy. And the worst part about it was I was so unaware of how exactly unhappy I was. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is fine. <laughs> Everything is fine. I just like go to work when it's dark and come home when it's dark and have takeout and have like <laughs> shitty. that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, I have shitty sex, but I guess I'm in this committed relationship. So I'm just going to keep <laughs> going. Like when I do have it, I'm like very under like whelmed with it. And then it comes with a fight because I'm underwhelmed because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And then I'm just like, this is what people do. This is what life looks like. And I'm like, no, like this, like, I mean, thank fuck for like, I'm not going to spoil the book, but there is a major thing that happens. Um, and, um, (laughs) and thank fuck that it happened and it wasn't my decision. And it was sort of like the worst thing that happened when it happened. But now looking back, I'm like, holy shit. Like, like what what I could have missed out on because like, I thought that I was going down the path that I was sort of supposed to follow. And yeah. like, how was I going to, cause as a headhunter, I was like, how was I going to justify a year off when you're 27? Like you're not 22 and in university, like there's, there was no more reason to take a gap yeah. year when you're closing in on your thirties and still don't have like a career path. Um, that, that is legitimate quote unquote. And so, and now that I've done it, I'm like, Oh my God. Like I, and I don't even know like, you're one of those people that you're like, okay, I have a mentor who said this and you have like these little, I don't even know how the fuck I chose to do this. Like there's no, like I know Amy told me and you met Amy uh, in episode one, but Amy told me like now or never write your book kind of thing. But she didn't say like, go and publish it by yourself and like make your life like a living nightmare. <laughs> she was just like, do the project for yourself. And then, and then the, the, the stuff that you end up like working out for yourself, like, like you say, the, it makes the wins so much bigger Yeah. because you realize that you are the only impetus to change is you like, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's undervalued nowadays to just recognize that like whatever change you choose to like that's that's a, already a positive development even if the change looks like sideways or backwards or whatever like yeah it, it doesn't it isn't linear like you're saying so <sighs> and unfortunately for me like the change was like this extremely tragic yeah event and like one of the things like I never want people to think that I'm taking this lightly like it's not like I was like oh this happened and like now my life is great like um (laughs) this is something that has like affected me to the core yeah um learning about Jeff's story and the other survivors stories and just becoming a part of this community it is something that has forever changed my life I was just telling Christine before we started I'm gonna go get a tattoo today yeah (laughs) (laughs) I mean it's something that literally has changed the makeup of my being um and I think that that is also what 
what helped me to what you said earlier, like if any other publicist had taken this on, it could have been a very good story. Like, I think it's almost good that I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have those pub you know, instincts that a normal publicist would, because my instinct was just to care for people and to take care of them and help them like at this horrible time. So if you don't have everything, just hold on to something like that and the rest will come. So even if you don't have a publisher, write your story and, and the rest will come. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree with that, that whole thing. And it was, it's funny. You should mention that in that way is on, um, on Monday I was, um, in a, car sharing, um, like I was going from Brittany to Paris and there was train strikes in France, shocking. Um, and so I had to take this like car share stuff and I'm in the car with, um, this guy who's in his like late thirties, no, actually late forties. Um, super interesting guy who, um, was telling me about like his coming out story in his late twenties to his family and stuff. And he's like, um, life now that he's nearing in his fifties and he's like had no kids and doesn't have like a stable partner, but like how he always sees the glass half full and how that like his life is full of wonderful people and blah, blah, blah. So we had the first half of the ride, just the two of us. And then we could pick up this 71 year old lady who like has more strength and energy combined like than, than anyone I know combined. And she's telling us about how she went swimming in the channel in November. And I'm like, I lived in the South of France and it was like too cold in April to swim in the Mediterranean. I'm like, I'm such a wuss. And so whatever, we're talking about our life stories, the three of us in the car. And she tells us, she's like, well, I lost my son when he was 23 to a tragic car accident. Ugh. And she's telling us, Um, she's like, well, you know, like I had this moment when I was like looking at this like rose tree, like this, this rose plant. And, um, and I thought to myself like, wow, these roses smell really nice. And this like other voice inside of her head was like, how the fuck dare you talk about like nice smelling roses? Your like kid just died. Like Uh, you should go and kill yourself. Like that was the other voice in her head. And she was like. Telling us, she's like, well, yeah, you do want to kill yourself because you want the pain to stop. But so I said to myself, looking at these roses, but the roses will always smell nice. There will, there will always be roses that smell nice. So I decided to, if I was not going to kill myself, if I was going to live, I was going to live a fucking full and happy life. Oh God. And, God love- but oh. yeah, bless her. Like, and she had such a positive and spirit energy that the car ride wasn't even like, it wasn't gloomy. It wasn't something that, you know, we were supposed to sit and wallow in. She wasn't like, I, I don't want, she's like, I don't want you to feel that any, in any of the feelings that I felt in that time. She's like, but roses will continue to smell nice. So like, oh, true. you're either there or not. And so I think that there's, she, she said, she's like, I'm never going to say like, that there's a positive out of every bad story. She's like, there's, I'm never going to say that there was anything positive about me losing a child and like that's never going to happen. <laughs> but like roses continue to smell. So true. How, how oh. great is that? So true. Like, that's what I love about you. I just feel like you are like a magnet. <laughs> for people. Like, you have this personality. Like you're so warm and easy to talk to. Like people can just open up and, and tell these stories to you. And ugh, it's how, awesome. Yeah, how great was that? So I thought that was a really nice reminder of like... You know, it's not, and she was telling us, she's like, it's not because the problems that you're having are like minor, that they're not your problems. She was referring to him, like taking a while to come out and stuff. And I was just sitting there like in this car full of wisdom um, and, uh, and just like so grateful for just the universe. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm definitely doing something right if this is what's coming back. Like I'm definitely following the right, um, winding road or like roads or whatever, you know, but didn't you start to find like, so like what you said about glass half full, half envy, like I felt like when I was in that similar moment of like misery with relationships and, and life trajectory and everything, like I, everything, the glass is constantly half, um, empty. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I would sweat the small stuff. Like I was just miserable and constantly stressed out. It was when I actually, which is actually very unlike me. Like I, I would say I'm like someone who like never had the balls to have balls. Like I never like would like make decisions and big I choices. Mean, you made a pretty big choice but, getting a divorce. But as soon as I did that, like, I mean, there are moments, like I said, where if my dog looks at me wrong, I cry and I have stressful yes. moments and I don't sleep some nights, but like for the most part, 
it was something about like once I got over that hump and made that choice for myself, like the glass is constantly half full now. Like, yeah. and if I don't know how to do something, like I figure it out and that's okay. And like, it's just given me this whole new perspective that like, thank God I grew those balls. Cause like, if not, it would have been a pretty miserable life. Yeah. And I feel like so many people like might not have that moment for whatever reason. Like it might, maybe life doesn't give them that moment. Cause like personally, like I said, like I, I can't pinpoint one decision I made to lead me here. It's like all tiny, tiny little decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but the, the, I think we just don't tell people, like, how great it can be. Like, it just seems scary. Like, there's no one... There, there are moments where it is, but... Yeah. But with the good come, you know... Yeah. You just keep rolling and the good will continue to come. And I think that that's, like, something that needs to be said more. Like, just make whatever decision it is. Like, the little ones and the big ones in the same way. Like, the roses are going to continue to smell. Like, like, maybe whatever decision brings a little more water and then your cup is full. Like, you know... W- I think we just live in this like rhetoric of like, you know, it's all advice columns, you know, like what to do if your relationship is shitty, what to do if you hate your job, what to do if your marriage is failing. And it's all like refractor. It's all at the end. It's not like what to do every day to make sure that you're like still keeping those little decisions in check or like that one moment where you choose to like, you know, grow like your own self-awareness of, of your life. And, and we don't tell people like how to do that. We're like in the, in the say, I'm sorry. And it's going to fix things. Like, no, <laughs> no, like don't stay in the job that you're miserable in. If your marriage or relationship like isn't meant for you, it's okay. Cause you're doing yourself and the person that you're with a disservice by staying yeah. in something that you're not happy with because yeah. the rest will come in now, you know, there were moments where I didn't remember that the roses were always going to smell good. Like I had some really deep, dark, horrible moments, but like now five years later, like I'm, I'm building a career that I'm happy about. I'm in an extremely happy relationship, you know, um, I'm getting there and it's just life is a process. Like, yeah. And and this is the thing, like even the extremely happy relationship is going to make you cry and is going to make you upset and your job doesn't come with a 401k and there is no one to replace you when you fall and break your ankle. Oh God. (laughs) Yeah. Less learned early on in this experience. Yeah. So, (laughs) I mean, it's not like, it's not like there's a secret to happiness. There's no moment in the movie where the music swells up and you're like blissfully happy there. I mean, there are glimpses, but they're glimpses because like without them, you wouldn't know the shitty stuff from the good stuff. But like there, there it's that whole process needs to be way more holistic in our understanding of how we make our choices and how we lead our lives. And yes. Okay. You might judge me for like, I don't know, shagging a hundred dudes, but like, (laughs) The next, the, like, the minute I choose someone to... I live vicariously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, yeah, but, like, the one I choose to, like, settle down for, I'll be like, I've seen all the dick I need to see, man. Like, I've made, you know, <laughs> like, but there's never going to be that in the back of my mind. So, for me, like, holistically, even if, like, some of them were great, some of them were bad, like, it's all going to come to a point. And maybe this book of mine, it will do well or not well or, like, many... But you did but I did it and it's going to bring me to another thing in the future that I'm not aware of yet. And regardless of how much it sells or how many copies you sell, like you have made relationships and, and built skills and experiences that like you otherwise never would have. And that's going to be what changes you. So exactly it. So I want to say cheers to ladies who grew balls. (laughs) Cheers to ball ladies. (laughs) Let's figure out like a, let's figure out a woman friendly (laughs) expression for this. (laughs) Because <laughs> I feel like that should definitely like there should be another way to say grow some balls that doesn't refer to like male genitalia. <laughs> just, take ch- just take the chance on yourself. You know, I think as women, like we feel like this constant need to take care of everyone around us, mm. and, which is important. Like you do need to take care of the people yeah. that you love, but like don't let yourself get lost in that. Yeah. Like take the chance. As scary as it is, like more often than not the the pros outweigh the cons yeah so that's like i think a good note to end on it's cats like positive wisdom <laughs> yay um so thanks so much for tuning in guys um me you're very welcome we can do this again anytime maybe next time we'll like chat some more rocka stuff <laughs> sounds good <laughs> I'm sure your boyfriend will love you talking about your sex life with me on 
on a podcast. Can't wait for that day. Um, but um, but in the meantime, um, you guys, yeah. So the f- uh, fifth year anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing is on April sixteenth. So tune in. And um, and as for me, I will speak to you very soon. Bye now. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.